where are those places in the world where communities have lived in one area generation after generation after generation and expanding through a, a millennia of a millennium of occupation um, those are indigenous people there in, uh, and but it, you can see the more you unpack it's hard to that define. it's yeah. hard to define um, um, it's almost like you kind of know it when you see it a little bit um, Welcome everybody to this week's uh, The Sea Has Many Voices, uh, a show that acknowledges that people and the oceans both share the same fate and that we need to hear from as many voices as possible. I'm continuing my talk with Dr. Darren Collins, the president of College of the Atlantic, and we're up here on the shores of uh, Bar Harbor in, uh, what's the name of this bay again? I forget that. Frenchman Bay. Frenchman's Bay. I can't, yeah. I can't believe I forgot the name of this bay. I spent so much time on the water out yeah, there. Yeah, I know. You know, I was, the, I was one of the first students, I know I was the first student that did any significant diving out here. And I tell you, Darren, there was so much stuff out there yeah. when I first went out. Yeah. Old bottles everywhere. Yep. It was, it was like... Oh, like, stuff meaning a really, garbage. Really, it was, yeah. this place has been habitated for a long time. Sure has, And yeah. no one had ever gone yeah. underwater. And I found uh, mostly I was intrigued by the old bottles, yeah. the 19th century bottle collection, which is out there. Yeah. Um, I found this one spot out off of that one called Rum Key. Yep. I dropped down there one day to get some scallops, and I found about 200 bullet bottles. You know those round bottom ones? Oh, wow. Yeah. Because they, they used to go out to that island, <clears throat> I can imagine, in the 1800s, drop the anchor, and they'd pull out the, you know, those bullet yeah, bottles? Yeah, I do. They, yeah, they're yeah. designed for a ship. Yeah. So you've got to put them in a hole. Yeah. You, they're not allowed, they've got a round bottom. Yeah. So that if you put them, you can't put them down anywhere but in their receptacle. Yeah. So that if the ship rolls, it doesn't fall over. Right. But they're quite collectible. So yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I think Eddie Monet went and cleaned it out when I told him about it. <laughs> <laughs> we call Diver Ed a yeah. lot. If people but, know College of the Atlantic, they maybe know you. They also know Diver Ed. Diver Ed, yeah. 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 Um, we are at College of the Atlantic. I went here, I uh, got my degree, undergraduate degree here, and I've never left the college. I've kept my relationships here, and I taught here for a lot, long time in the summers. And I'm now, I've really enjoyed our, I don't even want to call it a renaissance, because we never really had the first round until right. now. So yeah. this, is the, this is the beginning of, we heard of each other, but we're now working together on climate. Yeah change and I've uh, spent a lot of my career in the Pacific Islands working on ocean related climate change and Darren's a cultural anthropologist and runs the only institution in the world that offers this degree still of human ecology, human ecology yeah, yeah. which is the study of humans and their environment very yep. unique degree at College the Atlantic we'll put a link on the website so people can go explore it some more and you and I you and I found uh, a need uh, and we're we're still building the program, the idea. And let me let me articulate how I see it, and then we can unpack it for our listeners. Um, climate is changing. We are we are in our the early phases of a true, I think, runaway heating climate cycle. Um, interestingly, the energy that we're burning through fossil fuels today was laid down many millions of years ago, a lot of it in the Jurassic. And the Jurassic climate on the planet, most people, I like to use Jurassic because everybody understands Jurassic from the movies. They, they yeah. can, you can see it in your yeah. mind. It's like Bahamas everywhere. Yeah. Look at that. That's what the Earth was like back then. Yeah. Bahamas everywhere. The oceans were warm right down to the bottom. It was, a, it was not a very nice o ocean from our point of view because there was no ice on the planet. And ice makes the ocean work. My ice makes the ocean circulate. And it's the, it's the kind of ocean, the kind of planet that we humans and hominids evolved under. We like ice yeah. because it mixes the ocean, it, it regulates heat. And ironically, we're releasing energy that was stored during the Jurassic today yeah. in the form of fossil fuels. I like to think about it as sunlight from the Jurassic <laughs> yeah. that was stored in that <clears throat> magical... Uh, chlorophyll photosynthesis process that locks a carbon uh, molecule, um, atom away, and, and then we release it. So the energy was stored in the form of uh, sunlight that was embedded in, in organic material, and now we're releasing that Jurassic energy 
and we're sending ourselves back towards a Jurassic kind of climate. 5,000 times faster, I figured out recently, than the Jurassic itself arrived. Mm -hmm. And that, therein lies the That's problem. That's the key. Yeah, yeah. Therein lies the problem, is the speed of change. Is It's really got me worried, Darren. I've, uh, I've been concerned about it my whole career, but I'm becoming deeply worried about it this last year as I see the ice melt away so fast, because ice takes thousands of years to come back. It's not going to come back yeah. in any, any reasonable time frame. And the, there's been an impact on people, and we've established in a previous discussion that it's people and the environment that are important. It's, that, it's, it's the human well-being and people being supported by nature and biodiversity. So I've noticed, and you noticed, and this is where we came together, that coastal communities, well, not necessarily all coastal, I focus on coastal, so I always think ocean, but you focus, you're, more broad, you're much broader thinking than I am. But communities, and especially indigenous communities, are being impacted by climate change, and what are we going to do about it? And you and I envisioned something called the, what's it called now? We're going to call it the Indigenous Climate Scholars Program. Okay, now it's, yeah. it's an aspiration at this point. Yeah. We do have a first student has come in, and we'll talk about that student some other time. But the, do you want to describe the concept, or do you want me to keep going? No, no, I'll, I'll talk for a little bit. I mean, I think yeah. the um, the way to think about it is when we were both working for Bingo's World Wildlife Fund and Conservation International, we were always um, looking at global maps of, you know, biodiversity isn't spread evenly across the planet, right? It clumps in areas typically around the tropics, but, but not always. And um, so, Interestingly, indigenous peoples tend to live in those areas, both most affected by, by climate change. They manage a tremendous part of the globe, like one, one fifth of the planet. Um, and the future of that area that they manage will have tremendous consequences on the, the long-term trajectory of, of climate change. And so the, the idea is uh, we want people from those communities to have an undergraduate experience um, that sets them up so that they can return to their country or place of, of communities of origin uh, to become leaders in the world of climate adaptation and climate mitigation. Now, admittedly, this is a, a long-term strategy. We're talking about education here, and we all know that you know, this is, the time is now, like, so there's definitely a sense of urgency around climate. This is not going to be the silver bullet that fixes the climate problem, but I believe very strongly that education and higher education specifically can be one of the most important levers for change when we're talking about the, the climate change crisis. And, um, I believe that small cohorts of people exposed and ex with the right kind of experiences um, can become the leaders of, of the climate change movement in those key parts of the world, like the Brazilian, Peruvian, Bolivian Amazon, mm -hmm. Colombian Amazon Basin, uh, like the boreal forests of, of the Northern Hemisphere, like uh, the Pacific Islands, like Sub-Saharan Africa, all those places where indigenous people have the most intimate understanding of the way their world works. Mm. Importantly, we're not trying to say, well, we need to expose these people to the ideals of Western science, uh, because that is the only way of it. I think, importantly, one of the reasons why the College of the Atlantic can be the best place to do this kind of experiment is because we fully embrace the idea that local understanding of what we call traditional environmental knowledge is a valid way of understanding the world. Um, that together with a Western understanding of science is a, a very, very powerful um, engine for change. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow, there's so much there. I just want to, it's just like all these, I always like to think about, sometimes I think about, I used to rock climb a lot, and 
rock climbing is just like you look up this wall and you, you can't imagine you're going to go all thousand feet up there but you do handhold by handhold foothold by foothold you just gave me about 10 handholds to reach up for and start to to, <laughs> to keep going on this conversation um you know you said something that you that i hadn't thought of that really helps me think about this and that is by finding these indigenous nature human connections areas you're not just helping i don't like the word help you're not just uh you're not just getting that right getting that system right getting it sustainable for the indigenous people that live there but it'll have a knock-on effect for the planet oh yeah. which which yeah. I, I know is yeah. true and it, and but i i see it as a really great continued argument for this for this line of, of, uh, of approach yeah what is an indigenous a lot of the listeners aren't going to know what indigenous people are can you can you give us a textbook or, the, or not textbook description no you know because <laughs> there is a lot right, give of, me somebody else yeah, yeah, there, <laughs> there's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding and um uh, but generally the way to think about it are where are those places in the world where communities have lived in one area generation after generation after generation and expanding through a, a millennia of a millennium of occupation um, those are indigenous people there in uh, and but it, you can see the more you unpack it's hard to that, define it's yeah. hard to define um, um, it's almost like you kind of know it when you see it a little bit um, uh, but we don't want to get too caught up in in the in the, yeah. in the definition. Yeah. Um, but as a broad understanding, long occupation in very close working relationship with the environment um, will will point you in the right direction right. of indigenous right. groups. Yeah. Like for example, um, I mean everybody everybody is indigenous somewhere. We were <laughs> once indigenous. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. came from somewhere. You yeah. and I. Uh, from the looks of you, look like you're from Northern Europe. Irish. Europe. Irish. Irish. Oh, Irishman. Okay, yeah, yeah you do yeah. look a bit Irish. Yeah. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, my ancestors came over from Europe, but I, who knows, there were probably some Scandinavian village yeah. that uh, worshipped pagan gods and, right. uh, you know, through hatchets of people. Yeah. But they, but they knew, they knew their environment because they lived much closer to it. Yeah. And I think that's part of what, what we're looking for are, are communities that have influence, that have ownership, that have some form of governance, knowledge. I loved your description of natural indigenous knowledge. And I'm a firm believer there's a whole body of science there. Uh, and all science is is, is, a, is, a, is a system of rules that keeps us from lying to each other. It's a definition that I, one of my professors gave me once yeah. in college. But when I say that indigenous knowledge is science, what I mean is it's a valid way to understand and describe the world. Yeah. And not only is it valid, but it, it has a lot of uh, information that we've yet to to bring uh, bring to use. And a lot of it's empirical. And by empirical, I mean it's it's derived from firsthand experience yep. rather than experimentation. Yeah. And that's there's nothing wrong with that at all. Right. It's, uh, but it well, there's a there's a certain part of the science community that kind of turn their noses up at, at indigenous knowledge as a valid area of science. But I'm certainly not one of them. I yeah. embrace it. Um, so, you know, the thing that got me going about this, Darren, is that when you and I first talked about this about a year ago, I started thinking, well, what is it that I, that I do, that my colleagues have done, and that has been effective, or at least been moving in the right direction, in terms of getting this Earth, ocean, atmospheric, human system uh, to operate correctly? And it really involved... Uh, the multilateral organizations, it's a big word, but it just means the UN-esque uh, organizations where countries come together and have treaties and agreements and discuss and make decisions. It's, uh, um, that's a big part of my work over the years, is the UN. Also, working with the uh, other NGOs or bingos, and working with donors and working with businesses. It's yep. basically the storyline right there. And it's hard to find a school to learn that. I had to learn it on my own. Yeah, yeah. And and I realized that a lot of the work I was doing in regions that were indigenous was importing that knowledge and applying it to that situation. So to me, the what I like about this program is to bring students in when they're 
a teenager, give them that roadmap early and get them going on this. Yeah. Right away. Yep. Instead of stumbling towards it like I did for a career of picking it up on my own. Um, I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the utility that I see here. I mean, it's, it's bringing uh, those people most affected, those people in communities uh, that perhaps have new knowledge and angles on nature and climate change to the table on their, on their own. That's, that's key, on their own and inspire like already inspired you know at um college of the atlantic we're 350 students on the coast of maine with a degree in human ecology it takes a very special kind of person to to thrive in this kind of environment it's not for everyone you know and that's the same being indigenous does not automatically mean that you will be drawn to this this program you know it take, it'll take the the right kind of person regardless of their their cultural background you know this is a tough thing to say but I want to just to get it out there and talk about it a little bit but the the um, the there's a you got to get um, the proper respect has to be paid to the communities the acknowledgement to these communities and we need to get away from Historically, it's been a lot of patronizing relationships. I thought these, that's where you're going to go. these indigenous yeah. communities. Yeah. And it's nothing that, that angers me and annoys me more than, uh, than that. And I see it a lot. Um, some of my friends in indigenous communities tell me that foreigners come and make a market out of our misery. Yeah. If yeah. I could think about that for a second, what yeah. does that mean? Yeah. Tell me what you think that means, because you know what it means. I want to. I, I I do know what it means, and um, what has happened um, all over the world is um, largely white Anglo men. Let's be honest. Yep. Have um, gone off. You can picture the great you know, northern white explorer into indigenous cultures, and patronizingly or paternalistically holding up um, indigenous culture as somehow sweet and gentle on on the earth and that hasn't done anyone any good um, is that starting to get yeah. at what you what you're yeah. talking about and yeah. I think it works both ways right but there what, what I wanted to make sure we, we nailed down though was this market out of misery it's a there's a uh, there are problems in these communities there's a environmental problems, social problems, health problems, and, uh, but there's a, there's a lack of capacity. So you'll get organizations coming in, finding the problem, identifying the problem, running off to a donor, writing a proposal, getting a lot of money, yeah. maybe passing on a little bit to the community, yeah. and, and definitely working on the problem. Yeah. But they're basically running their business on somebody else's misery yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or a problem. And, and then you end up with this help word a lot. Yep, dependency. It's, it's, right. And it's just yeah. such a such a wrong uh, dynamic. And the way to to rectify that, the beauty that I see in this approach that that you're beginning to you're pioneering here is to uh, build that capacity early. A lot of the technical training and educational opportunities for developing countries or least developed countries happens at graduate school or it happens in professional environments. Yeah. So you get a lot of programs for training government employees to do yeah. different things. But to bring undergraduates together and orient them with the tools to navigate this complex world that we've created, I think is, is it will work. I think it's the way to go. And that's why I'm so excited about, about it. Uh, for two reasons. One is the, it gives them a lot more of a runway in their life to, uh, yeah. to, to use the tools. And secondly, you talked about building a cohort or a, like a, I like the word posse. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, one of the, uh, some of the Ivy League schools in the United States, there's a, there's a feeling, and I think it's actually pretty true, that you just get into the school and that's the, most, that's the hardest thing. And then it's about building your relationships with your fellow classmates mm -hmm. and your teachers. Mm -hmm. And then you end up on your road to success. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I see with this one, Darren, is that building the relationships amongst the indigenous fellows and then 
the fellows to their other COA students, and then the next ring out is the other colleges and other uh, institutions throughout the world uh, early. Get them going early. Imagine, and, imagine being part of a cohort of a small number. I really believe that small is beautiful in, in this, and we're not trying to industrialize this educational model. We're, we're looking for the right number of the highest quality, the most inspired students coming together, joining a community of about 350 students, where those, the rest of those students are from 47 countries and 42 states. So you're living in a small, but a very global community. Um, with faculty who are here specifically as mentors, guides, and teachers. And the idea is how do we expose all of that mix of, of people to an educational philosophy that is about learning by doing, uh, first and foremost. And where climate change is concerned, I like to think of it as a kind of local to global model. Like we want people exposed to what you talked about, about uh, the UNF triple C, triple C and um, the IMF and the World Bank and those international institutions. But we also want people exposed to the, to the way national policy works and we want people working with the Maine state government. We're in the state of Maine and we also want people to spend an awful lot of time out on the water and the Gulf of Maine is one of the most quickly warming bodies of water on the planet. Is that right? It you is. That the other it day. is. I didn't know that. It is. And I want students who can navigate not just the international world, not just the world of donors and finance, uh, not just the world of nonprofits, but also can speak from the heart about the ocean, right? And um, there's no better place to do it than, than right here. And I think...